I had a Netflix double feature. Check it out. First, I saw Marriage Story, and it was pretty great. It's nice to know Woody Allen knockoffs have gotten so good they can effectively replace him, so now I can enjoy these kinds of movies without glorifying the work of a child molester. From what I'd heard about this movie, I didn't get the masterpiece experience a lot of other people did, but this is still really good. The locus of discussion around this film seems to be the dialogue and performances, and while I won't discount those things, director Noah Baumbach also used the movie's peripheral elements in a way that puts those central ones forward. The most surprising part of Marriage Story for me was just how well shot it was. A lot of dramas especially can end up with very flat cinematography in the hopes the actors are good enough for people to just not notice. But with Marriage Story, I enjoyed the various camera movements and how the staging allowed for different shot composition. The way many of the indoor scenes were shot really gave me a sense of familiarity with the locations in the film. I felt much more involved in the important conversation since my knowledge of the space matched the characters. This is the same director as Francis Ha, another movie that's beautifully shot like this. But that aside, the biggest draw to this movie is its two leading performances. A lot of people have criticized the acting in Marriage Story, which I don't really get. It was a thing on Twitter where the big argument scene was uploaded and everyone thought they were doing a really bad job. Now I'm willing to bet a majority of that comes from people's sudden distaste for Scarlett Johansson, which is a shame because pound for pound this is probably her best performance. I'll admit without context some scenes might feel a little off, but their performances often require sweeping changes in emotion only capable by experienced actors. Adam Driver does an expectedly great job, and I'm not surprised both performances are frontrunners at the Oscars this year. The movie also boasts some entertaining work by character actors like Wallace Shawn and Alan Alda, who do a great job in their limited roles. The only performances I didn't really enjoy were the divorce lawyers, played by Laura Dern and Ray Liotta. Their performances were both just corny and stereotypical. When you get down to it, Marriage Story is a quite serious film, both in what we see as well as its thematics. Save these two performances, the movie handles this divorce with profound understatement that, while I'm as far away from marriage as I am the surface of Mercury, let the audience experience the weight of small gestures that mean everything in such a painful situation. No shade to them as actors at all, I love them both, but their material was so out of place with the film's tone. Bombach was doing such a good job presenting both these people realistically go down a slippery slope of pettiness and justified anger that they didn't need these characters to be as hammy as they were. And before anyone says I don't, I get why they're written that way. I get it. I get their symbolic presence as manifestations of what Nicole and Charlie could become if they give in to the growing desire to hurt one another. We didn't need Laura Dern saying, Oh honey, I love hurting men, so let's bleed Ben Solo dry. And Ray Liotta going, Oh Christ man, don't all women just love making us look bad? To get the point across. These two performances are comedically well executed, but kind of interrupted the seriousness of the rest of the film. Anyways, I still enjoyed the rest of Marriage Story a lot. It doesn't resonate with me on a deeply personal level, and to tell you the truth, I hope I never get to a spot where it does. Even though it's a powerfully acted tale, only helped by its deceptively intricate technical blueprints, I much prefer Bombach's Francis Ha, even though I would ultimately give the two movies the same score. And I'll give Marriage Story an 8 out of 10. The other film I watched this week was Martin Scorsese's The Irishman. Now whether or not you enjoy all of Scorsese's films, dude has been making movies deemed to be classics one after another for almost half a century. Some directors are celebrated as the best for making one movie deemed a classic, and this dude has been going so strong a movie as good as Silence could be considered a hidden gem among his work. He's earned the right to be called one of the greats and can do anything he sets his mind to. And with The Irishman, Scorsese has accomplished his goal of making the single longest movie ever made. It's long. It's the kind of long movie where, sure, everything serves a purpose, but that doesn't make the movie feel any shorter. You're in for the long haul watching this, and I can't say it encourages me to watch this again multiple times the same way I do movies like Goodfellas or Scorsese's earlier work like Taxi Driver. I wouldn't say the film was ever boring, and it helps that you can pause it since this is a Netflix movie, but above all else, the length shows me he wasn't exactly able to filter out what was the most important to the story. 
You have no reason for The Irishman to be your longest narrative film when you're the guy who also made The Aviator. There's something to be said for telling an epic story without throwing conciseness out the window completely. The Irishman is the kind of movie you watch to yourself and say, These actors are very old. The de-aging special effects and makeup are top-notch, but there's only so much you can do to convince me Joe Pesci will not die if you sneeze on him. There are moments in the film where you can tell they can't quite deliver their lines with the same gusto they could have in their prime. Robert De Niro has to beat up a guy on the side of the road and the fight choreography looks so fake. You can't blame people for getting old, but if it gets in the way of the experience, it gets in the way of the experience. Now before I sound like a total asshole, all three of these actors do a fantastic job in spite of this. As best they can, they portray a diverse range of ages that all feel physically different. On just a surface level, these performances are all very good. In many ways, The Irishman is a celebration of these actors and what they're capable of. These are all very prototypical roles for the people playing them. You think of Scorsese and you think of gangster movies. The main character might be a stockbroker or a union boss, but you think of that same template, exploring opulence and power with the same caliber of actors who have earned their keep as screaming Italian man. I want him dead. I want his family. My client, the Honorable You get Robert De Niro, you get Joe Pesci, you get Al Pacino, you get... Ray Romano, I guess. My name is Ray Romano, and I play Bill Buffalino in The Irishman, and I don't know how I got the job either. Put them all together in an epic film chronicling the life of some powerful guy, and you have what everybody imagines in their head when you bring up a Scorsese movie. In almost every way, The Irishman is a deliberate homage to Scorsese's work from the 90s. It's sprawling and epic. Scorsese knows how to make his characters memorable. Everybody important has a reasonable character arc and are entertaining to watch. There are hints towards the end of a much more reflective mood. De Niro spends his last days meditating on how he can possibly be forgiven now that his time has passed, and puts the melting pot of sins he's accumulated into perspective. It's very much the film you'd expect from an aging master director starring a cavalcade of aging master actors, with all the familiarity you might expect. As a throwback, The Irishman does its job of rounding out a triple feature of Goodfellas and Casino. I wouldn't say it's as good as either of those, but it's still very entertaining. Give it a watch, just make sure you have your whole day cleared out to do so. And I give it a 7 out of 10.